Brilliant, thank you. And thank you to William and everybody else um, who's read for us um, as well um, tonight. I want to um, just sort of focus a little bit in on, on some of the things that we've been singing about just for a few minutes um, now. But as a sort of a way in, I wanted to just mention a few Christmas games. Has anybody got a particular game you're looking forward to playing over Christmas? Is there a family favourite out there that you're sort of looking forward to? Oh, oh, is that where you sort of pass grab. them round and grab them and it's yeah. chaos? It's, it's Fab. Don't expect to have fingernails. <laughs> yeah, I remember that from sort of camp, uh, camp days, camp games. Um, we're looking forward to a few games. Um, I think Ellie, being at university, has sort of been introduced to other games that she's then brought back um, into our family. So, yeah, really enjoy those sort of things. I've brought some along with me. Um, just, I think, some that appeal to my... Um, sort of wanting a puzzle, something to solve, um, that sort of thing. So um, there they are. Um, I'm not receiving any you know, money from any companies for this. Um, but Linky, um, I guess m most maybe have come across Linky. It's quite a good game. If you like your quiz questions, um, there's cards in there with, with kind of, I think it's four quiz questions to answer. But the, the aim of the game then is to spot the link between the answers so it's a little bit more of an extension on there, but that's quite good fun, quite enjoy sort of. And I think you can, I think if my memory serves me right, you can sort of buzz in when you think. So even if you've just got two answers, you can sort of go in and, and try and spot the link or wait for three or four or so on. So that's quite good. Um, Cluedo, I guess, um, is one that'll be familiar to, to most of us. Um, um, yeah, different characters, different murder weapons. I think there may be some slides actually, if you can find the first one up there. Um, but yeah, different um, characters, murder weapons, locations, very well known Cluedo. Um, this one is um, a bit more, well, I think it's a bit more recent. It seems like a bit of a, a kind of a, a building on the Cluedo idea. 221B Baker Street. Has anybody played that? No, well, not, you've got time before Christmas to order that in. Um, this, this one is, is it's a little bit more involved. So you get read a scenario. Um, different characters, certain locations, certain bits of information, and um, you've got a nice big board, various sort of locations, um, I guess around a city, there's some docks and a theatre, various places, and of course as you go into each location, um, you're given clues, um, which again, is, if you go back a slide, just helps us um, to locate who the murderer is, what the weapon is, what the motive is, that sort of thing. Um, and then once you think you've solved the crime, you've then got to get to 221B two, two Baker Street and, and sort of make your guess when, when you're back in, in that um, particular location. But that's a bit more, bit more stretching. Um, and again, you can dash to Baker Street before you've fully got everything, if you think you've managed to kind of put all the clues together um, and so on. But that's a, a good one. The other one we've uh, played recently, um, I think it's called Scotland Yard. Um, which is a big map. We've seen that big map of London, all the tube stations, bus routes, taxi routes, and uh, whoever is, I think it's Mr. X or Mrs. X, you, you get your location on the map, but nobody else knows where you are. And so you've, um, you, you sort of move around using the taxis, the buses, uh, the tubes. And every so often, I think it's every, like after maybe three goes, or then after another six goes, you then have to reveal your location. Everybody else in the room is a detective, so you're then chatting about, oh, if they got the bus from there, they could be there, and you basically try and hone in and find the people. So anyway, that's me. I enjoy solving a puzzle. I enjoy these sorts of games where you've got to kind of come up with the, the who did it, the weapon, the motive, um, that sort of thing. And I want us to sort of try and take that in to just looking at a few of the Bible verses, some, some of which have been read to us um, already um, tonight. And just to put a sort of a detective hat on, um, because I think there's something worth us exploring um, here in terms of the Christmas story. I think if we leap over the Monopoly board onto the, the first glance slide, which is the next one, um, we, um, it, we've got to, we're here tonight, if you think about it, we're, we're remembering the birth of a baby, of a human being, that took place 2,000 years ago, so it's a long time ago, and yet we're still here, as we were last year, and we will be, you know, God willing, next year, remembering the birth, um, celebrating the birth of this child. Um, there's just under 200 countries in our world, and I would imagine in pretty much every one of them, there will be some people 
in every one of those countries remembering the birth of a baby 2,000 years ago. Um, I don't think it was quite as comfortable as that picture makes it look in, the, in amongst the animals um, and in the straw, in the, in the animal trough. Um, but there's clearly something worth looking at. And I think if we go to the next slide, just as we look at uh, probably three Bible verses um, fairly quickly, I want us to try and puzzle together some of the pieces um, of this sort of jigsaw. These are the words that were read to us by Joel, actually, from uh, Luke chapter 2. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. The words that were spoken to those shepherds who then went to look um, for the babies. A couple of pieces of information with our Sherlock hats on in there. A couple of the titles. A saviour is born. Christ the Lord is born. I think saviour is something that's quite easy to, to come to a grasp as to what that means. It seems to imply rescuer of some sort. Uh, this baby will be a rescuer. Um, I don't know if you've seen Spider-Man yet. I won't give any spoilers, but it's a good film. <laughs> um, and clearly, you know, people like Spider-Man, there's the, the idea of rescuer or saviour is there in, in those films. Um, if you're following any of the cricket at the minute, I know Pete, who did our first reading, is no doubt. And we desperately need a saviour. <laughs> desperately. Australia are absolutely thrashing us at the minute. We need somebody to stand in. Tomorrow, I won't say for your prayers, but we need someone to bat all day to save the match. We need rescue. And we're told this baby will be a saviour. We're also told he's, he's the Christ. He is Christ. And if you're really into your sort of game playing and your solving of puzzles, you know, that's a huge clue as to what's going on in, in that sort of animal trough. Christ. Um, the Old Testament, really, from King David onwards, is looking out for this figure in the future who will be the Christ. So it's a massive clue. Here's somebody who's been promised. His coming has been predicted. David was told, as the second king of Israel, that one of his descendants would be Christ. He would be God's anointed king, but he would be an eternal king. He would reign over an everlasting kingdom. And here we're told the Christ has been born. And I imagine as the shepherds got to the animal trough and saw the baby, you know, it's not quite the setting they would have been expecting for God's everlasting king. And yet the very place where they'd gone to, Bethlehem, was also predicted as being the birthplace of the Christ. So suddenly the picture begins to build. If we go on to the next slide and our third glance, and we go here to Matthew chapter 1 and words spoken to Joseph before um, Jesus was born, very specific instructions that they're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. It had to be Jesus. Jesus means the Lord saves. He is God's saviour. But this clue gives us a bit more information. In 221B Baker Street, you go, some of the clues are in two or three parts. So you go into one room and it's like part one of three in the motive clue or something. So you've got a bit of the information, then you've got to get to another room to find the other bit and put it all together. And this verse, this naming verse to Joseph, is a commentary on the previous verse. We knew from Luke 2 that he's going to be saviour, but we know in Matthew 1 that he is saviour because he will save his people from their sins. So there's no green goblin, there's no Voldemort, there's no ashes whitewash. It's a people needing to be saved from their sins. One Christmas, we, I think it was a Christmas, maybe been a birthday, we bought Henry a dartboard. And um, if you come round, you'll know that just from the evidence on the door all around the dartboard. Um, when the Bible speaks about sins, it uses a lot of darts imagery, missing the mark. So sometimes the board is missed completely. And there's, there's holes, don't, don't tell the deacons, but there's holes all the way around the edges um, of the door. Sometimes the Bible speaks about falling short. So some darts don't even make it to the board. They're in the carpet in front of the door. Missing the mark, falling short. The Bible speaks about that in real terms, in terms of the way we treat other people. That's missing the mark in terms of what God has designed us for. It's mistreating God. It's falling short of the glory of God. Every one of us falls short and we miss the mark. There's a gulf between us and God, a chasm. We don't know it a lot of the time, but we, we, we offend God in the way, by the way we treat him and each other. But Joseph is told, give him the name Jesus, 
the Lord saves because he will save his people from their sins. He will save them from missing the mark. He will save them from falling short, mistreating God and others. The next sort of glance on the next slide, the fourth glance, another clue. This is written by John, one of Jesus' dearly loved disciples, um, towards the end, I think, of John's life. And he's reflecting, looking back, he says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Sort of John's looking, as it were, over the events of Christmas, his commentary on them, the love of God demonstrated sending his only son. John carries on in the very next verse. He says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's amazing, isn't it? When we think how we've treated God, how we treat one another, we miss the mark, we fall short, we offend him, we push him to the edges of our lives. And yet he loved us, we're told here. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son for us. It's going to happen, isn't it, in our homes, I would imagine, on Christmas Day. People are trying to show their love for one another in the things that we give. And this is astonishing, isn't it, that this is love. Not that we love God. We're not, God, God is not, he's looking out, as it were, as we're thinking of in the family carols. We've made ourselves his enemies, according to Romans And God responds to us, his enemies, in this way. He loved us and sent his son for us. And the purpose of it all, in there at the end of that verse, that we might live. It's a a deception, really, I think, that we think, don't we, that that we're, we're enjoying life, we're embracing life apart from God. As if we don't need God, you know, what we have one life, you know, let's live it to the full. And yet Jesus says, I've come that you might have life. The implication being that you may think you have life without God, but but it's a delusion. I have come that you may have life and life in all its fullness, said Jesus. Life different now, but life that will go on into all eternity. We didn't love him, but he loved us. And then finally, on the the sort of final set of verses, and the one William read to us, very famous, John 3, 16, these verses show that we still have a choice in all of this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We think back to what's happening on that first Christmas. God is acting to demonstrate his love in order that we need not perish, but that we might have eternal life with him. Whoever believes in the Son, says these are the words of Jesus in John 3, whoever believes in me, in the Son, has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. So God has done amazing things. And we have an amazing choice to be made. On the 23rd of December, 1984, a long, long time ago, look it up in your history books, I was 13 years old and went to a service just before Christmas, two days before Christmas. I went knowing very little, actually, about Christian things. I went with very little interest, actually. And maybe some people here tonight like that. I didn't really want to go. My family were going. I had to go. And on that night, I can sum it up pretty much in six words. In the course of the evening, I realised that I had actually offended God. It's only 13 and a half, but I had no doubt, no doubt that I had not lived rightly. I had not treated God rightly. And the word that stayed with me now, 150 years later, is that I had offended God. And I knew that was true. The second thing that happened as that service went on is the second word is I, I was amazed at the lengths God had gone to to put that situation right. I could not believe that he would do that for me. And then four words, four things followed at the end of that service as I talked with somebody and prayed with somebody is that I believed 
in that moment, had no shadow of any doubt. I knew very little, but I utterly believed that God had sent his son into the world to deal with my sin, to make rescue and reconciliation possible. I believed it with all of my heart. I thanked him for what he'd done. What's that word number four? I asked him to forgive me. And I gave my life to him. And everything that we've been singing about and reading about and hearing about that God has done, I, I, t- I embraced that and I took that. And God, in his great mercy, uh, forgave me, came into my life, changed the direction of my life. And in light of what we see on the screen there, changed my eternity. And that's an offer um, that's there before us all this evening. I think one of the things, things mull over in your mind when you've been through the service once and then, and then we're th- coming through a second time, just thinking about it. And the thing that struck me, um, I'd love to, to leave with you, you, is that you may be quite angry with God tonight. And I want to say to you that he still loves you. Your anger does not dissolve his love for you. He is incredibly patient. There is an end to his patience, but it's not now. And he will wait for you. And he will call to you again on Christmas Day. And he will call to you next Christmas. And he will call to you whenever you will listen. He's patient. His love for you is there on the cross. For you to see and he made you and he fashioned you and you're valuable and he gave the best thing he had to give to make you his and he will wait for you at the moment now is the time of his patience a time when he's calling us to come and trust him i'm going to just say a prayer um, and this is very similar to the prayer that I prayed on the 23rd of December 1984. It acknowledges that we're in the wrong with God. It acknowledges what he's done for us. And it asks him to forgive us and to come into our life. And if that's something that you want to pray tonight and for those verses and that reality to become yours, then pray this quietly yourself and maybe let somebody know later on uh, that, that you've prayed it and you've put your trust in him. Let's bow our heads and pray before we have our last song. Dear God, I know that I am not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I am guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you, and I need your forgiveness. Thank you for sending your son to die for me, that I may be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life. Please forgive me and change me, that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. Amen.